Welcome to the On-Premise IT Podcast, the only show that dares to be both on topic or on premise and on location or on premises. Each time we meet, we bring together a group of IT luminaries. In this episode, we're talking to a group of folks from Storage Field Day about the future of storage. And quite frankly, uh, one of the things that we hear quite a lot of is that basically everything has gone to flash, everything is flash memory, and not, um, you know, disks are passe. Tape? What is tape? We even talked to a company that doesn't want to admit that they're using tape. But, uh, you know, the truth is actually a little bit more nuanced than that. Flash hasn't really replaced disk all that much, and flash certainly hasn't replaced tape, and neither has disk. So today's premise is that Basically, disk and tape are never going to go away. They're just going to continue on, and Flash is just going to get more important, but, you know, never going to go away. Before we dive into that, though, let's meet who's on the panel today. Hi, I'm Jim Saprinsky. I'm uh, a technology advocate for Zero Defect Computing. You can find me on Twitter at Jim the Y Guy. I'm Richard Kenyon. I've been in the IT industry for about 25 years. I'm currently an infrastructure engineer at Kubrick in Buffalo, New York, and you can find me on Twitter at Richard Kenyon. I'm Ray Lucchese. I've been in the IT industry almost 50 years, uh, much of that in storage, uh, doing type and disk types of storage, so it's very interesting. I'm at Ray Lucchese on Twitter. I'm also a podcast co-host at Graybeards on Storage, and I blog at rayonstorage.com. Com. We've seen a lot of things over the years, you know. I, we both remember before, and Jim, I mean, I honestly, all of us probably remember before flash memory was really a storage media. I think it's easy to forget that this stuff was is fairly recent, and before that, you know, you had disk and tape, and, and there was a lot of controversy over disk displacing tape and, and all this. Is, is it, do you think it's ever going to change, Ray? Are we going to... Well, ever... I, I think what you're finding in, in solutions like this that... They, they become, I, relegated is not the quite, quite the right word, but they find a niche and they stay there for a long time. The only way they can be displaced from that niche is if they stop investing in the technology. Tape is continuing to invest in technology. They're doubling capacity every, I don't know, two and a half, three and a half years. Disk is continuing to invest in their technology. They're doubling their capacity every 18 months, 20, 36 months. As long as they continue to do that, uh, they will continue to have a place to play. Uh, tape, uh, quite frankly, tape is still active and being used quite a lot, and there's lots of money being made there. Is it growing? It's probably not growing in revenue. It's growing in capacity. <laughs> and uh, a lot of the larger hyperscalers and larger data-saving entities in this world are using tape and will continue to use tape because it's economically viable and it's, it's environmentally viable. Disk has a similar type of thing. Now, I, I haven't seen tape in the small uh, business enterprise for a long time. The last time I even touched a physical tape was about 2008, and we were replacing it with a, a hard drive-based system for backups. Mm -hmm. And it's still there, it's still relevant, but in the day-to-day -day small business entity world, I, I think it's just completely gone. It's been replaced by cloud solutions, it's been replaced by uh, on-premises storage, it's been replaced by both of those things. In, in small quantities, tape doesn't make sense anymore because it's something you have to physically touch and physically maintain. Uh, some of the earlier generations of tape software weren't the most user-friendly and there was a lot of overhead to it. Uh, looking into the new tape vendors now and how the software works might be a significant improvement, but I just haven't seen it in the small business area. So it's, it's interesting. We were chatting back and forth via Slack uh, during Storage Field Day 24, and one of the interesting things that came up was anybody remember zip drives, right? Which, you know, again, I think it was a 100 megabyte yep. capacity. Then right? went to 250. Yeah, and then it went, right. Um, I don't think I've touched a tape cartridge since probably 2005, 2006. So I can, I, yep. I can fix this for you what? guys. It's not really that hard. I can get you tape cartridges. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> I've got but, friends in the tape business. Yeah. yeah. But, but that's a good point. I, I think that um, it's not, the tape is not something you encounter very frequently. And it hasn't been, for, for what it's worth, it hasn't been for a long time. I mean, when I was, uh, when I was an undergrad, uh, most of us actually did <laughs> carry around our projects and our work on a tape, a uh, reel of tape, uh, as a way to move, you know, back and forth to the computer center or something like that. But even then, that was considered 
kind of strange. And now, uh, obviously, people don't do that. When I was in IT, uh, you know, certainly we did encounter a lot of DLT and uh, later LTO uh, and eight millimeter at, at first. And then, you know, we encountered a lot of tape, but not so much. I think that the tape infrastructure that is there is hidden from people for the most part because it's, it's really, you know, kind of buried deep in the infrastructure layer. And as Ray says, a lot of cloud providers are still using a lot of tape. They just don't talk about it. Yeah, and another <laughs> aspect behind it, it's still around. The only thing that disturbs me about tape personally is you don't know if it's good or bad until you actually put it in the cassette reader or mount the tape or whatever, and then you find out that, as it happened to me one time, the beginning tape mark wasn't there. And you know, now again, that's back last millennium, but you know, th there's no predictive analytics, if you will, on uh, a cassette tape, really, to see if it's okay. And my experience was similar. It wasn't hardware-based from the tape losing its marking or the indexing not working. It was always the software that the backup software that I was yep. using at the time was still one of the worst pieces of software I've ever used. <laughs> it, was, it was absolutely yeah. awful. I couldn't manage the library. I couldn't do backups easily. I couldn't do restores right. easily. The process of backing it up to the tape and the tape working never was a problem. The tape always worked. Mm -hmm. It was always ready to go, but the software interface in front of it just was not there. Listen to me. Tape has certain characteristics. Yes, it, you, can't, you can't tell if it's bad until it's actually mounted and read. And yes, there can be software associated with these things and the front end of these things that, that cause problems with it. But the characteristics are, you know, once the tape is written, you can put it on a shelf and keep it there for 25 years. It costs no power, it costs no cooling, it costs no, you know, other than space, <laughs> uh, it's pretty much impregnable. Uh, yes, it can have problems, and yes, you probably want to read it every five years or so, and maybe even rewrite it every 10 years or so, but to a large extent, it's the most efficient, economically efficient, environmentally efficient storage known to mankind. Mm. And, and not only that, but in terms of manufacturing as well. We talked to Fujifilm about that a while back at Storage Field Day, mm. and they were showing the incredible environmental benefits. I mean, you think a tape cartridge is made of plastic, it's got some, but it's actually really low impact to make that thing as opposed to a hard disk drive or flash memory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but, I mean, disk drives aren't going away. I mean, disk drives have their own yeah. characteristics, and they have to be powered on, and they have to actually, you know, you have to seek and, and do things, and there's, there's time and effort to uh, support it and, and provide support for it and provide software around it, but it's got its capability. I mean, if you, if you look today, if you look at the market today, there's probably 75% of the storage bits being manufactured today is disk. Mm. Not flash, and and, so, and and not tape anymore either. And so it's, it's still a significant portion of the market being generated today. And who's using it? The hyperscalers. And why are they using it? It's cheap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and reliable. And thanks for that. For that, Ray. Yeah. I, I I actually wanted to take that next step. So we talked about tape. Let's talk about disc. Um, most of us, just like tapes, we don't encounter tape drives in our daily life. Most of us don't encounter computers with disk drives in them anymore either. And disk drives were everywhere. I mean, there was a disk drive in the dashboard of my car. There was a disk, board, a disk drive in my iPod. There was a disk drive you know, in my, uh, my computer, of course. Um, and, and all those are gone. So are disk drives irrelevant? No, not at all. Disk drives uh, are well, well-known technology. And they have not only increased in speed and capacity over the years, Every piece of software written from probably 1970s to today was specifically designed for tracks and sectors. And it still is, even though you put an SSD in a system, that entire software stack is still designed for that technology. It's very efficient, it's well known, and the number one rule in storage is don't lose data. Exactly. And exactly. if you have a hard drive that's powered off, bearing a mechanical defect, that data will be there when you turn it on. Mm. And that is due to the software stack that's behind it. So it's very, very relevant in the backup industry. It's very, very relevant in servers. You may not touch it in your workstations or laptops or you know devices and cars and things like that anymore, but I touch a disk at least once or twice every few months just to either swap one out, to add new capacity to something, to build it into a local server that's sitting in a closet because it's cheaper than SSD at the moment. 
Yeah, I right. use disks to back up my, my laptop. I use disks yep. to back up my desktop, and I keep them in safe deposit boxes. I keep it in a shoe box. I keep them everywhere. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, disk is there. It's going to continue to exist. There are these graphs. You'd have to see the graphs, but there's a trend on, you know, it, it's, it's, it's data per square millimeter or whatever, and, and, and the trends are all the same. So SSD is this way, disk is underneath it at you know, 10x, and then tape is underneath that at 10x. So as long as they can maintain that technological gap between those technologies, those technologies will continue to, this, to exist. And when they stop, that's dead. Yeah, and you can augment disk with SSD. You know, so even, exactly. even people who are you running small business- with disk. Yeah, but you're not. But you, were you ever using tape to in the last twenty years to actually run systems live, or was it always a backup medium? Last twenty years in That's media a tough entertainment. Thing. Yes. yes. Okay. Yep. But you can still. For my my point was that you can still buy hard drive based systems and put a couple terabytes of SSD cache in front of it, and that system will be fully performant for years to come for the specifications that you bought it for. You know, if you don't need, you know, a million to two million IHOPs sitting in your uh, server closet, buy a smaller system that's mm -hmm. more cost effective. It'll be perfectly fine for what you utilize it. You'll never see the benefits of all of that SSD power if you're running all flash. Now, all flash is lovely if you can afford it. Mm -hmm. But if you're cost constrained, that's one of the first things that you change is uh, all SSD to, you know, hard drive. Yeah, I, I remember it's almost 12 years to today that I was at a storage uh, seminar uh, hosted by Oracle in downtown San Francisco, and someone had the audacity to say that in 10 years, the only place you'll find a disk drive is in a museum. And there were <laughs> blasphemer, things like that were actually coming out. And at the time, I could see that that would happen, possibly, but predictions as they are. It's the same thing with mainframe, right? Mainframe has been around since, uh, God, the, the early 60s, right? Sure. It still exists today. The reason it still exists today, it's, it's, it's technologically okay, and they're continuing to advance technology every year or every two years, a new Z, Z system comes out. And it's, it's, it's embedded into so many systems today that it would be painful to pull it out. Mm. But, sure. And as long as they continue to advance the technology, it'll continue to exist. Is it growing? Is it revenue growing? Probably not. But the capacity or the MIPS that are being used there are growing. Yeah. So I, I want to make the point, too, that one of the things that happens a lot of the time is that the technology sort of finds its niche, finds its spot. And, and I think one reason, you know, Richard's question here about, you know, what used tape for primary storage, um, yeah, not a lot, mm. you know, because that wasn't its greatest niche. I mean, tape is, is great for streaming data. And so things like, you know, broadcast recording and things like that worked pretty well on tape, but you had to kind of match the bit rate or else you'd be in trouble. And, you know, it turned out that tape was much more efficient in the way that Ray was describing it as a backup and archiving medium. Discs, similarly, I think that one of the challenges with discs is that they have all sorts of, you know, constraints on their usability and they're not so good uh, in terms of IOPS, uh, random IOPS and reads and writes and, and all that. I mean, they're, they're better than tape for sure, but they found, their, they found their place and their place really wasn't in your portable music player. It was uh, somewhere else because Flash displaced it there. I worked for a company one time and, uh, and uh, one of the managers there said that most people don't care where their data actually is stored as long as they can access it from memory very, very quickly. Right. So if it's got you know, tape behind it and drink, <laughs> if it's properly archived or hierarchically stored so that it was in memory when you wanted it, you're fine. Right, right. You know? And you're starting to see things uh, here, <coughs> interestingly, uh, where things like persistent memory are actually starting to kind of take the place of that uh, SSD flash cache uh, area, if you will, or conundrum. So uh, the other aspect is that, I, I'm going back to what Ray said, right, is, well, can I get to my data fast enough? It's not that you know, I have super you know, excellent speed. Really, uh, very few applications require that level of speed. You know, somewhere below five milliseconds access time is probably okay for most applications. And <clears throat> for the record, the DBA said that. 
that's, okay, 10 milliseconds, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Ouch. Ouch. Uh, and there are ways that I can make that better. But the, the point is, I guess, fast enough you know, is good enough for, for almost, especially the applications now that, as we were talking here uh, today and yesterday, was that a lot of it is much more towards data science, right, or, or analytics, uh, possibly even predictive or prescriptive analytics. Unless you're, you know, trying to deflect an asteroid and you have to do, you know, super magical calculations to do that every, you know, one one millionth of a second, it's probably okay. Well, that, so, I think that's the, the thing, right? It's not that it's fast enough or cheap enough or power, low powered enough or capacity or whatever. It has to be good enough. It has mm -hmm. to be good in all the different aspects right. for whatever the application is. And, but you bring up another point there, and I want to kind of dive into that. So the, there was this industry trend to look into persistent memory. I mean, we saw the Optane uh, kind of come and now go. Um, there are other persistent memory technologies out there that companies are talking about still. Uh, do you think that these are going to be another layer of uh, another part of the hierarchy above above uh, flash it, memory, it, or is flash memory it? They were there, right? I mean, for a long time, when when 3D Crosspoint came out, we thought it was going to take over the industry, hmm. and it was going to be, you know, it was going to find its niche at the top end of this thing, and 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 flash was going to be pushed down, and everything else is going to be pushed down. The fact that it hasn't hasn't turned out yet. <laughs> is a problem, but uh, it's because it was very costly to manufacture and they never reached the volumes that they wanted to. If they reached the volumes they wanted to, they'd probably be fine, but it's just not there. But can it get there someday? Yeah. Is, is MRAM maybe the next solution rather than phase change memory? Maybe. Whatever it is, there's something on the, on the horizon there that's going to be the next technology. Well, Flash yeah, is going to be relegated to its, its own little niche. And that's exactly what I was trying to get at, is you know, right now we live in the Flash era. Absolutely, and it's easy to think that disks and tape are irrelevant, but they're absolutely not. They have their own niche. Is there another era? Flash? Yeah. Well, I was thinking the same thing, is if, if the new persistent memory comes out and does what it promises in a consumer-friendly manner, we're not, talk, talk, not talking data sciences or schools or people who are, have dedicated teams programming applications for it. It's, I have a software stack that I need to stand up in my small business or even large business, and I go to Dell or HP or EMC or IBM or NetApp or Pure or any and name a storage vendor and say, I want to buy this array because because it does this many IOPS, which is it? Is it going to be persistent memory, or is it going to be uh, SSD, or is it going to be hybrid, or is it going to be spinning? If it can be consumer friendly in a you know eighty percent exactly. of the industry, that's when your niches are going to come out. Because that's how SSD came out. It went in all the storage vendors. It went in all of the hard drive, uh, all of the laptops, and all of the desktops, and all of the phones and the iPods. It became easy to consume. And if you don't make it easy to consume, nobody's going to consume it. I realize that NAND's been around since, God, uh, probably the 1990s, maybe even mm -hmm. the 1980s yeah. or something like that. They've been working on NAND technology for a long time. Before it became an SSD, SSDs really came out in, what, 2005, 2006, yeah. something like that? They came out in thumb drives first, right? Yeah. And then yeah. there were compact flash cards yeah, before yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. But, and, you know, right. so right. it takes a while for a technology to gain traction. It, it has to find a niche in some, in some sort of a market where it can start to build up volume. And, and, you know, to a large extent, you know, 3D Crosspoint came in as, as a niche in, in, in persistent memory and for, and it just didn't, it just didn't gain the traction it needed to. Mm. I, rem I remember Rambus Ram. Yeah. 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 Well, RE-RAM exists. MRAM exists. PCM exists. All these technologies yep. exist. They're on, they're on a track to get there. They're just not there yet. Yeah, so I think the original NAND uh, from, you know, EEPROMs and EEPROMs from ah, the 1970s. 1980s, right? 1970s. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, that nobody would have guessed that that would have taken over the world in, you know, 20 years later. But what I'm trying to, what I want to ask actually to you guys is, uh, how are you so sure that Flash won't become cheap enough, uh, high enough capacity, durable enough, et cetera? Wh why are you so sure that Flash won't edge out disk drives? Because we're talking uh, today at Storage Field Day, we mentioned that there were you know 60 terabyte SSDs on the horizon. Um, well, there aren't 60 terabyte hard drives on the horizon at all, mm -hmm. not for a long time. And frankly, hard drive capacity has been sort of stalled. Mm -hmm. So why are you so sure that the, that flash doesn't mean an end to disk drives? Yeah, the question is, can they maintain the gap between 
a price per gigabyte for flash. They didn't talk about the 60 terabyte flash drive costs today. And they didn't talk about how many QLC NAND chips would have to go into such a thing. But you know, yeah, yeah, you can do it. Yeah, it can be done. And, and, and to some extent, the fact that they're now just not only scaling two-dimensional, which is you know, QLC, yep. TLC, and PLC, they're also scaling three-dimensional, gives them uh, a lot of flexibility. Yeah, we're over 200 layers now. Yeah, well, I understand that. And, and, and this right. guy's talked 192 layers for QLC, which is pretty impressive. Right. It's cost, though. You know, a 16 terabyte drive and a 32 terabyte drive discs, in arrays you cannot, are 14 you grand a pop from OEM vendors. Yeah. That's expensive when you say you can get a $1,000 drive that's half as much capacity. It's spinning, but you can put one SSD in front of it that's 800 gigs, and the total cost of solution for the entire thing is less than the one SSD that you want to fill an entire bank of stuff with. Yeah. Right. Right. Right now, the cost is just a massive swing. And it, it's affordable, much more so than it was 10 years ago. But when you compare the cost of hard drives to the cost of SSDs at massive scales, the maximums, mm -hmm. it's, there's, the graph is just huge. Well, but are they? That's the thing. So you look at the cost of SSD or hard drives. The hard drives really haven't come down that much in price or gone up that much in capacity in the last few years. And I don't know if that's... They're still, they're still increasing capacity, yep. still coming down in price. It's not like it's going away. I mean, and, and you know, it's still 75% of, of the storage market every, every year is being generated it's on disk or 67%, whatever the number is, but it's not mm -hmm. gone away. I mean, there are niches for this technology and it will continue to exist in that, that niche as long as they can continue to invest and continue to advance the technology. The moment they decide to not, is it's death. And maybe that will happen because, I mean, that's the other thing is that we're down to just a few makers of hard disk drives. We're down to maybe, I think, one maker of heads. Um, is there still going to be advancement in that technology? And another interesting aspect of that, too, that we actually talked about of the four presentations we talked about in two of them, right, is the E of the ESG component, right? Uh, yes, disks are still being manufactured, but they are heavier. They probably require a lot more energy per, you know, per drive, if you will, to cool, to power, and everything else. And if, again, we were asking for some stats on that, right? But if SSDs suddenly become dramatically uh, less of a, a carbon footprint, if you will, and again, how you would calculate that, that's another story, I think you might start to see people go, mm, let's start thinking about going more in that direction. But it's not going to happen overnight. It's simply not going to happen overnight. Well, yeah. No, and I don't think anybody thinks it is. But yeah, I'm and, and to before, you, before you keep going, is you keep mentioning hard drives have an increase in capacity. I have seen hard drives double in capacity from 8 to 10 to 16 to 20, and now I see 22, 22 terabyte drives I can buy off of Amazon, slap in my Synology, have eight of them, and I've got you know a, a significant server in my house now. It used to be I had 10 gig drives, and then I had 100 gig drives, and I still couldn't fill up that, and even 10, 15 years ago, I still can't fill up a 120 gig drive. I'm not doing movies so and video creation and content with, creation. With, with the, There's big the, consumer drives out there right now. What we find with disk is there, there are technological epics, and it, it, it's associated with the, uh, the head technology, the media technology, and they go in these leaps, and, 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 and for a couple of generations, they're not changing the technology as much as you know, fiddling around, around the yeah. edges, but every once in a while there's this technolog technological leap that occurs that takes them in a whole different um, mm. track from a density yeah. perspective. And yeah, it's slowing down, the density doubling is slowing down, but it's not slowed down completely. Well, now, now I'm going to poke at you about tape then, because you look at tape the technology. Way. Here's the thing about tape. Tape uses disk technology that's 10 years old. So the heads that are in a tape drive are 10-year-old disk. So as disk continues to continue to increase in tape capacity, follow it. tape will be there. So you yeah. think we're going to have uh, heat-assisted tape? What's to stop a laser on a tape drive from assist, you know, to, to melting <laughs> The, or or he, warming up the, the, the bit pattern that's on, on the... No, yeah, sure, why not? If that's what, if that's what it takes, yes. But I think that's... that's uh, I'm just trying to push at this, because you, know, you look at it, so there's really only one vendor of tape drives now. There's really... I mean, is there more than one vendor of tape media? I think there is more than one vendor of tape media, but there's only two. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, there's only three hard drive manufacturers. Yeah, exactly, and that's and that's thing. that can be argued to down to two. Yeah. And you look at you look at these technologies, and it's clear that the so I don't know how if the many man vendors we have out there? Five, six today? Yeah. Yep. Okay. And, and so one of them's not... owned by a hard drive manufacturer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, what I'm trying to do is kind of just push at the at the question, and I think that I think right now we don't see a time when hard drive is is really substantially pushed to the side. But I think that they're it, it you know hard drives have to keep keep up, tape drives have to keep Absolutely. up, and if they Absolutely. don't. And there's no saying that they will, then they will be pushed aside. Looks what happened to optical, right? And that's I, what I was gonna bring up next. Optical <laughs> CDs and DVDs, they, just they were going so day. well and, and it was great and great. All of a sudden the technology stopped being invested in because it wasn't it was being driven by consumers, and consumers moved on. Yep. yep. Absolutely. And 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 optical is I think a great example because that that line that you mentioned, the good enough thing, it all stopped. And suddenly the capacity wasn't there, the cost wasn't there, everything didn't make sense anymore, and optical as a storage medium is dead. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't say, now there's obviously we've talked, to, there's some companies that are working on some exciting new technologies there. Maybe they'll, maybe optical as a storage medium will come back with new technology, but right now it's. I mean, you look at the ecosystem behind uh, disk drives and media and heads and stuff like that. The ecosystem behind NAND fabrics and stuff like that. There's a lots and billions and billions of dollars going into this technology. Optical doesn't have that anymore. It had that when it was a consumer product, but it's lost it. Yeah. <laughs> Optical was fast, easy to use, reliable. You, you could rarely damage it except for scratches and even those were few and far between if you right. if you're really honest with yourself and then one day i bought a computer that didn't have an optical drive in it and went well just got to use something else it's just gone <laughs> like I, I never touched it again after i didn't have one in my home personal computer even game consoles now i know we talk about blu-ray was the next big optical thing but and now 4k and uh videos that come on your, your playstation or your xboxes that's the only place i still see <laughs> those and those are still geared toward digital downloads now. They now have hard drives and SSDs in them because the optical medium wasn't able to keep up with what the game yeah, industry was doing. With no yeah. optical now. Yeah, so, and I honestly think the next iteration of both those systems are not going to be uh, optical anymore. They'll be straight digital. So <laughs> let's uh, sum it up then. Um, the question was, is uh, well, the point, the premise of this discussion is that flash is not going to displace disks and it's not gonna displace tape. Uh, are you committed to that? I pretty much yeah. agree. Yeah. Yeah. For for the foreseeable future, I'm very committed to that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Can we agree that we stop at tape? I don't want to go back to Hollerwood cards. Yeah. I just <laughs> just want to say that I don't want to know what a card file is or have to describe it to somebody. Yeah. yeah I'm pretty confident that doesn't have a big future in computing, I, but we'll see. <laughs> maybe maybe it will. You know. Maybe knows? it's this time to retire. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us uh, to the, for this conversation. Uh, before we go, uh, please let us know again where we can find you. Uh, what's your blog or your uh, articles or podcasts or where? So you can find me at Jim the Y Guy on Twitter. Also, JimTheYGuy.com for my blog post. And I'm also the co-host of BeyondTechSkills.com podcast. Uh, we talk about everything about tech except tech. Uh, Richard Kenyon. I'm also on Twitter at Richard Kenyon and LinkedIn at Richard Kenyon. And I also do a lovely podcast with two other co-hosts and it's IT Reality US. I am at Ray Lucchese on Twitter. I am rayonstorage.com as a blogger, graybeardsonstorage.com as a podcaster, and silvertonconsulting.com is my company. As for me, I'm Stephen Foskett. You can find me at S. Foskett on the social medias. Uh, you can find me at gestaltit.com. I am the host of the On-Premise IT podcast along with Tom Hollingsworth. You'll also find me hosting the Utilizing Tech podcast where we're doing a season focused on CXL technology after three seasons focused on AI and ML. And of course, you'll find me on the weekly Gestalt IT News Rundown. This episode of uh, On-Premise IT is brought to you by gestaltit.com, your home for IT coverage from across the enterprise. You can find us in your favorite podcast applications. Uh, please do subscribe there. You'll also, also find us on YouTube at YouTube slash Gestalt IT video. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>